Hey guys, we're back to reading My Side of the Mountain. We're starting on page 25 and it's going to end on page 45 for part 3. In which I find many useful plants. The following morning I stood up, stretched, and looked about me. Birds were dripping from the trees, little birds singing and flying and pouring over the limbs. This must be a warbler migration. I said and I laughed because there were so many birds. I had never seen so many. My big voice rolled through the mount rolled through the woods, and their little voices seemed to rise and answer me. They were eating. Three or four in a maple tree near me were darting along the limbs, pecking and snatching at something delicious on the trees. I wondered if they were anything for a hungry boy. I pulled a limb down and saw there were leaves, twigs, and flowers. I ate a flower. It was not very good. One manual I had read said to watch what the birds and animals were eating in order to learn what is edible and non-edible in the forest. If the animal life can eat it, it is safe for humans. The book did suggest that a, that a, rac that a raccoon had more nearly like us, had, had taste more nearly like us. Certainly the birds were no example. Then I wondered if they were, they were not eating something. I couldn't see tiny insects, perhaps. Well, anyways, whatever it was, I decided to fish. I took my line and hook and walked down to the stream. I lay on a log and dangled my line in the bright water. The fish were not biting. That made me hungrier. My stomach pinched. You know, it really does hurt to be terribly hungry. A stream is supposed to be full of food. It is the easiest place to get, get a lot of food in a hurry. I needed something in a hurry, but what? I looked through the clear water and saw the tracks of mussels in the mud. I ran, along, I ran along the log back to the shore, took off my clothes and plunged into the icy water. I collected almost a peck of mussels in a very little time at all and began trying them in my, in my sweater to carry them back to the camp. But I didn't have to carry them anywhere. I said to myself, I have my fire in my pocket, I don't need a table. I can sit right here by the stream and eat. And so I did. I wrapped the mussels in leaves and sort of steamed them in coals. They were not quite as good as clams. A little stronger, I would say. But by the time I had eaten three, I had forgotten what clams tasted like and knew only how delicious freshwater mussels were. I actually got full. I wandered back to great-grandfather's farm and began to explore. Most of the acreage was maple and beech, some pine, dogwood, ash, and here and there, glorious hickory. I made a sketch of the farm on my road map and put X's where the hickories were. They were gold trees to me. I would have hickory nuts in the fall. I could also make salt from the hickory limbs. I cut off one and chopped it into bits and scraps. I snuck them in my sweater. The land was up and down and up and down and I wondered how great-grandfather ever cut it and plowed it. There was one stream running through it, which I was glad to see, for it meant I did not have to go all the way down the mountain to the big creek for fish and water. Around noon, I came upon what I was sure was the old foundation of the house. Miss Turner was right. It was ruins, a few stones in a square, a slight depression for the basement, and trees growing up right through what had once been the living room. I wandered around to see what was left of the gribbly home. After a few looks, I saw an apple tree. I rushed up to it, hoping to find an old apple. No apples beneath it. About 40 feet away, I found a dried one in the crotch of a tree, stuck there by a squirrel and forgotten, a squirrel and forgotten to eat it. I ate it. It was pretty good. It was, it was pretty bad, but nourishing. I hoped there was another apple tree and three walnuts. I scribbled X's. They were wonderful finds. I poked around the foundations, hoping to uncover some old iron imp implants and that I could use. I found nothing. Too many leaves had fallen and turned to loam. Too many plants had grown up and, di and died down over the old home site. I decided to come back when I had myself a shovel. Whistling and looking for food and shelter, I went on up the mountain, following the stone walls, discovering many things about my property. I found a marsh 
In it were cattails and arrow leaf, good starchy foods. At high noon, I stepped into the mountain meadow. An enormous boulder rose up in the center of it. At the top of the meadow was a, meadow was a fringe of white birch. There were maples and oaks to the west and a hemlock forest to the right that pulled me right across the sweet grasses into it. Never, never have I seen such trees. They were giants, old, old giants. They must have begun when the world began. I stared. I started walking around them. I couldn't hear myself step so dense and damp were the needles. Great boulders covered with ferns and moss stood among them. They looked like pebbles beneath those trees, standing before the biggest and the oldest and the most king-like of them all. I suddenly had an idea. This is about the old, old tree. I knew enough about the Catskill Mountains to know that when the summer came, they were covered with people. Although Great Grandfather's farm was somewhat remote, still hikers and campers and hunters and fishermen were sure to wander across it. Therefore, I wanted a house that could not be seen. People would want to take me back to where I belonged if they found me. I looked at the tree. Somehow I knew it was home, but I was not quite sure how it was home. The limbs were high and not right for a tree house. I could build a bark extension around it, but it would look silly. I slowly circled the great trunk. Halfway around the whole plan became perfectly obvious. To the west, between two of the flangs of the tree that spread out to be the roots, was a cavity. The heart of the tree was rotting away. I scraped at it with my hands. Old rotten insects, ridden dust, came tumbling out. I dug on and on using my axe from time to time as my excitement grew. With much of the old rot out, I could crawl in the tree and sit cross-legged. In sight, inside I felt as cozy as a turtle in a shell. I chopped and chopped until I was hungry and exhausted. I was now in the hard, good wood, and chopping out was work. I was afraid December would come before I got a hole big enough to lie in, so I sat down to think. You know, those first days, I just never planned right. I had the beginning of a home, but not quite a bite to eat. And I had worked so hard and could hardly move forward to find that bite. Furthermore, it was discouraging to feed that body of mine. It was never satisfied and gathering, for it took time, and I got hungrier. Trying to get a place to rest, it took time, and I got more took time and got it more tired, and it and I really felt I was going in circles. And I wondered how primitive men ever had enough time and energy to stop hunting food and start thinking about fire and tools. I left the tree and went across the meadow, looking for food. I plunged into the woods beyond, and there I discovered the George and the white cascade splashing down the black roots into the pool below. I was hot and dirty. I scrambled down the rocks and slipped into the pool. It was so cold I yelled. But when I came out on the bank, I put my two pairs of trousers and three sweaters which I thought was a better way to carry clothes than in a pack. I, ting I tingled and burned and felt coltish. I leapt up from the bank, slipped, and my face went down in a patch of dog-tooth violets. You would know them anywhere after a few looks at them, at the botanical gardens and in colored flower books. They were little yellow lilies on long slender stems with oval leaves dappled with gray. But that's not all. They have wonderfully tasty bulbs. I was filling my pockets before I got up from my fall. I'll have a salad type lunch, I said as I moved up the steps, side, steps, sides of the ravine. I discovered that as late as it was in the season, the spring beauties were still blooming in the cool pockets of the woods. They are all right raw. That is if you are hungry as I was. They taste like little lima beans. I ate these and I went on hunting food.
feeling better and better until I worked my way back to the meadow where the dandelions were blooming. Funny I hadn't noticed them earlier. Their greens are good, and so are their roots, a little strong and milky, but you get used to that. A crow flew into the aspen grove without saying a word. The little I knew of the crows from following them in Central Park, they always have something to say. But this bird was sneaking, obviously trying to be quiet. Birds are good food. Crow is certainly not the best, but I didn't know that then, and I launched out to see where it was going. I had a vague plan to try to noose it. This was the kind of thing I wasted time on in those days when time was so important. However, this venture turned out all right because I did not have to noose that bird. I stepped into the woods, looked around, could not see the crow, but noticed a big stick nest and a scrabbly pine. I started to climb the tree. Off flew the crow. What made me keep on climbing in face of such, such discouragement, I didn't know, but I did. And that noon, I had a crow egg and wild salad for lunch. At lunch, I also solved the problem of carving out my tree. After a struggle, I made a fire. Then I sewed, sewed a big skunk cabbage leaf into a cup with grass strands. I had read that you can boil water in a leaf, and ever since then, I had been very anxious to see if this were true. It seems impossible, but it works. I boiled the eggs in a leaf, and the water keeps the leaf wet. And although the top dries up and burns down to the water level, that's as far as the burning goes. I was pleased to see it worked. Then here's what happened. Naturally, all this took a lot of time and hadn't gotten very far on my tree. So I was fretting and stamping out the fire when I stopped with my foot in the air. The fire. Indians made dugout canoes with fire. They burned them out an easier and much faster way of getting results. I would try fire in the tree. If I was very careful, perhaps it would work. I ran into the hemlock forest with a burning stick and I got a fire going inside the tree, thinking that I ought to have a bucket of water in case things got out of hand. I looked desperately around me. The water was far across the meadow and down the ravine. This would never do. I began to think the whole inspiration of a home and in the tree was no good. I really did have to live near water for cooking and drinking and comfort. I looked sadly at the magnificent hemlock and was about to put the fire out and desert it when I said something to myself. It must have come out of some book. Hemlocks usually grow around mountain streams and springs. I swirled on my heel. Nothing but boulders around me. But the air was damp somewhere, I said, and darted around the rocks, peering and looking and sniffing and going down into the pockets of the dales. No water. I was coming back, circling wide, when I almost fell in it. Two centennial boulders dripping wet, decorated with flowers, ferns, moss, weeds, everything that I loved. Water. Guarded. A bathtub-sized spring. You pretty thing, I said, flopped on my stomach, and pushed my face into it to drink. I opened my eyes. The water was like glass, and in it were little insects with oars. They rode away from me. Beetles skittered like bullets on the surface, or carried a silver bubble of air with them to the bottom. Ha! Then I saw a crayfish. I jumped up, turned rocks, and found many crayfish. At first, I hesitated to grab them because they can pinch. I gritted my teeth, thought about how much more it hurts to be hungry, and came down upon them. I did get pinched, but I had my dinner. And that was the first time I had planned ahead. Any planning that, di that I did in those early days was such a surprise to me, and so successful that I was delighted with even a small plan. I wrapped the crayfish in leaves, stuffed them in my pockets, and went back to the burning tree. Bucket of water, I thought. Bucket of water. Where was I going to get a bucket? How do I think? Even if I found water, I could get it back to the tree. That's how citified I was those days. 
I had never lived without a bucket before. Scrub buckets, water buckets, and so when a water problem came up, I just thought I could run to the kitchen and get a bucket. Well, dirt is as good as water, I said as I ran back to the tree. I can smother the fire with dirt. Days passed, working, burning, cutting, gathering food, and each day I cut another notch in the aspen pole that I had stuck in the ground for a calendar, in which I meet one of my own kind and have a terrible time getting away. Five notches into June, my house my house was done. I could stand in it, lie down in it, and there was room left over left over for a stump to sit on. On warm evenings, I could I would lie on my stomach and look out the door, listen to the frogs and nighthawks, and hope it would storm so that I could crawl into my tree and be dry. I had gotten soaked during a couple of May downpours, and now that my house was done, I wanted a chance to sit in the hemlocks and watch the cloudburst wet everything but me. This opportunity didn't come for a long time. It was dry. One morning, I was at the edge of the meadow. I had cut down a small ash tree and was chopping it into lengths about 18 inches each. This was the beginning of my bed that was planning to work on after supper every night. With the golden summer upon me, food was much easier to get and I actually had several hours of free time after supper in which to do things. I had been eating frogs, legs, turtles, and best of all, an occasional rabbit. My snares and traps were set for now. Furthermore, I had a good supply of cattail roots. I had dug in the marsh. <clears throat> If you ever eat cattails, be sure to cook them well. Otherwise, the fibers are tough, and they'll take more chewing to get the starchy food from them than they are worth. However, they taste just like potatoes after you've been eating them a couple of weeks. And, to my way of thinking, they're extremely good. Well, anyway, that summer morning, when I was gathering material for bed, I was singing and chopping and playing a game with a raccoon I had come to know. He had just crawled into a hollow tree and had gone to bed for the day when I came to the meadow. From time to time, I would tap on his tree with my axe. He would hang his sleepy head out and snarl at me, close his eyes, and slide out of sight. The third time I did this, I knew something was happening in the forest. Instead of closing his eyes, he pricked up his ears and his face became drawn and tense. His eyes were focused on something down the mountain. I stood up and looked. I could see nothing. I squatted down and went back to work. The raccoon drove out of sight. Now, what's got you all excited? I said, and tried once more to see what he had seen. I finished the post for my bed and was looking around for a bigger ash to fell, ash to fell and make slats for the springs when I nearly jumped out of my shoes. Now, what are you doing up here all alone? It was a human voice. I snug, I swung around and stood face to face with a little old lady in pale and a pale blue sunbonnet and a loose brown dress. Oh gosh, I said. Don't scare me like that. Say one word at a time until I get used to a human voice. I must have looked frightened because she chuckled, smoothed down the front of her dress and whispered, Are you lost? Oh no, ma'am, I stuttered I stuttered. Then a little fellow like you should not be alone way up here on this haunted mountain. Haunted, I said. Yes, indeed. There's an old story says there are little men up here who play nine pins right down in that George in the twilight. She peered at me. Are you one of them? Oh, no, 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 I said. I read that story. It's just make-believe, I laughed, and she puckered her forehead. Well, come on, she said. Make some use of yourself and help me fill this basket with strawberries. I hesitated. She meant my strawberry supply? Now get on with you. A boy your age should be doing something worthwhile instead of playing mumbly peg with sticks. Come on, young man. She jogged me out of the meadows. We worked quite a while before she said any more. Frankly, I was wondering how to save my precious, precious strawberries. And, I'm, and I may say I pick slowly. Every time I dropped one in her basket, I thought how good it would taste. Where do you live? 
I jumped. It is terribly odd to hear a voice after weeks of listening only to birds and raccoons. And that is more to hear about your voice and ask a question like that. I live here, I said. You mean Delhi? Fine, you walk me home? Nothing, I added, did any good. She would not be shaken from her belief that I lived in Delhi, so I let it go. We must have a... We must have reaped every last strawberry before she stood up, put her arm in mine, and escorted me down the mountain. I certainly was not escorting her. Her weary little arm were like crayfish pinchers. I couldn't have gotten away even if I tried, so I walked and listened. She told me all the local and world news, and it was rather pleasant to hear about the National League, an atom bomb test, and Mr. Riley's three-legged dog that chased her chickens. In the middle of all this chatter, she said, That's the best strawberry patch in the entire Catskill Range. I come up here every spring. For 40 years, I've come to the meadow for my strawberries. It gets harder every year, but there's no jam that can beat the jam from that mountain. I know I've been around here all my life. Then she went right to the New York Yanks without putting in a period. As I helped her across the stream, on big boulders, I heard a cry in the sky. I looked up. Swinging down the valley on long pointed wings was a large bird. I was struck by the ease and swiftness of its flight. Duck, hawk, she said. Nest around here every year. My man used to shoot them. Shoot em. He said they killed chickens, but I don't believe it. The only thing that kills chickens is Mr. Riley's three-legged dog. She tipped and teetered and crossed the rocks, but kept right on talking and stepping as if she knew that no matter what, she would get across. We finally reached the road. I wasn't listening to her very much. I was thinking about the duck hawk. This bird, I was sure, was a pre-grind falcon. The king's hunting bird. I'll get one. I will train it to hunt for me, I said to myself. Finally, I got a little... Finally, I got the little lady to her brown house at the edge of town. She turned fiercely upon me. I started back. Where are you going, young man? I stopped. Now I thought she was going to march me into town. Into town? Well, that's where I'll go then, I said to myself. And I turned on my heel, smiled at her, and replied to the library. The king's provider. Miss Turner was glad to see me. I told her I wanted some books on hawks and falcons and she located a few. Although there was not much to be had on the subject, we worked all afternoon and learned enough. I departed when the library closed. Miss Turner whispered to me as I left, Sam, you need a haircut. I hadn't seen myself in so long that this had not occurred to me. Gee, I don't have any scissors, she thought a, she thought a minute, got out the library scissors and sat down on the back steps. She did a fine job and I looked like any other boy who had played hard all day and who, with a little soap and water after supper, would be going off to bed in a regular house. I didn't get back to my tree that night. The May apples were ripe, and I stuffed on those as I went through the woods. They taste like very sweet banana, are earthy and a little slippery, but I liked them. At the stream, I caught a trout. Everybody thinks a trout is hard to catch because of all the fancy gear and file, flies and lines sold for trout fishing, but honestly, they are easy to catch, easier to catch than any other fish. They have big mouths and snatch and swallow whole anything they see when they are hungry. With a wooden hook in its mouth, the trout was fine. The trouble is that trout are not hungry when most people have time to fish. I knew they were hungry that evening because the creek was swirling and minnows and everything else were jumping out of the water. When you see that, go fish. You'll get them. I made a fire on a flat boulder in the stream and cooked the trout. I did this so I could watch the sky. I wanted to see the falcon again. I also put the trout head on the hook and dropped it into the pool. A snapping turtle would view the trout head with relish. I waited for the falcon patient, patiently. 
I didn't have to go anywhere. After an hour or so, I was rewarded. A slender speck came from the valley and glided above the stream. It was still far away when it folded its wings and bombed the earth. I watched. It arose clumsily and big, carrying food and winged back to the valley. I sprinted down the stream and made myself a lean to near, a lean too near, some cliffs where I thought the bird had disappeared. Having learned that day that duck hawks prefer to nest on cliffs, I settled for this site. Early the next morning, I got up and dug the tubers of the arrow leaf that grew along the stream bank. I banked these and boiled mussels for breakfast. Then I curled up behind the willow and watched the cliff. The falcons came in from behind me and circled the stream. They had apparently been out hunting before I had gotten up, and they were returning with food. This was exciting news. They were feeding young, and I was somewhere near the nest. I watched one of them swing in the cliff and disappear. A few minutes later, it winged out empty-footed. I marked the spot mentally and said, Ha! After splashing across the stream in the shallows, I stood at the bottom of the cliff and wondered how on earth I was going to climb the sheer wall. I wanted a falcon so badly, however, that I, that I dug in with my toes and hands and started up. The first part was easy. It was not too steep. When I thought I was stuck, I found a little ledge and shined up to it. I was high and when I looked down, the stream spun. I decided not to look down anymore. I edged up to another ledge and lay down on it to catch my breath. I was shaking from exertion and I was tired. I looked up to see how much higher I had to go when my hand touched something moist. I pulled it back and saw that it was white bird droppings. Then I saw them. Almost where my hand had been sat three fuzzy, whitish gray birds. Their wide open mouths gave them a startled look. Oh, hello, hello, I said. You are cute. When I spoke, all three blinked at once. All three heads turned and followed my hands as I swung it up and towards them. All three watched my hand with open mouths. They were marvelous, I chuckled. But I couldn't reach them. I wormed forward and wham, something hit my shoulder. It pained. I turned my head to see the big female. She had hit me and winged out, banked, and started back for another strike. Now I was scared, for I was sure she would cut me wide open. With sudden nerve, I stood up, stepping forward and picking up the biggest of the nestlings. The females are bigger than the males. They are the falcons. They are the pride of the kings. I tuck her in my sweater and leaned against the cliff, facing the bullet-like drive of the falcon. I threw out my foot as she struck, and the swole of my tennis shoe took the blow. The female was now gathering speed for another attack, and when I say speed, I mean 50 to 60 miles an hour. I could see myself battered and torn, laying in the valley below, and I said to myself, Sam Gribbley, you had better get down from here like a rabbit. I jumped to the ledge below, found it was really quite wide, slid on the seat of my pants, and next ledge, and stopped. The hawk apparently couldn't count. She did not know I had a youngster, for she checked her nest, saw the open mouse, and then she forgot me. I scrambled to the river bed, somehow being very careful not to hurt the hot, fuzzy body that was against my own, however frightful, as I called her right then and there because of the difficulties we had in, in getting together. Did not think so gently of me. She dug her talons into my skin to brace herself during the bumpy ride to the ground. I stumbled to the stream, placed her in a nest of buttercups, and dropped beside her. I fell asleep. I woke up. When I woke, awoke, my eyes opened into gray eyes and a white strubly head. Small pin feathers were sticking out of a stru stri sticking out of the strubly down like feathers in an Indian quiver. The big blue beak 
curled down in a snarl and up in a smile. Oh, frightful, I said. You are a raving beauty. Frightful fluffed her nubby feathers and shook. I picked her up in a cup in the cup of my hands and held her. Under my chin, I stuck my nose in the deep, warm fuzz. It smelled dusty and sweet. I like that bird. Oh, how I like that bird from that smelly minute. It was so pleasant to feel the beating life and see the funny little awkward moments of a young thing. The legs pushed out between my fingers. I gathered them up together with the thrashing wings and tucked the bird in one place under my chin. I rock. Frightful, I said. You will enjoy what we are going to do. I washed my bleeding shoulder in the creek, tucked the thorn threads of my sweater back into the hole they had came out of, and set out for my tree.